Welcome to New Life. We're excited you're here. For those of you that don't know my beautiful bearded face, my name is, uh, that's a self-proclamation, by the way. I tell that to myself every morning when I look in the mirror. But <laughs> my name is Pastor Brad. I'm really excited to have you guys here with me today. And we are in week two of a, new, of a series called Planted. We're really excited. So this is a two-week series. Last week, we talked about why you should be in the church. This week, we're going to talk about why you should stay in the church. So um, I believe that the Bible teaches us the value of being planted or plugged into a spiritual family. So we talk about it a lot. We talk about it in our life, and you know, we talk about life groups. We talk about it in our church family, you know, and even sometimes we just need a little reminder that, that we need our spiritual family. But we live in a world today that is so connected digitally and often and, and is becoming more and more disconnected relationally every day. And even as we've had the world events that have transpired over the last 12 to 18 months, we've seen that become even more so, you know, because of, because of different things, people staying in their homes and, and making sure that they are where they're supposed to be. But many of us live lives that are isolated Many of us live lives that are separated and we're uprooted from solid foundations. We're uprooted from these solid relational foundations. And so, but all throughout the Bible, we see the same theme that plays over and over and over again. And it's that God created us as relational creatures. He created us to be in community with one another. And he gave us a longing for belonging. I like that. It rhymes and it sounds good. So I'm going to ask you to say it back to me. Everybody say longing for belonging. Awesome. We're off to a great start. I'm going to ask you to actually, I'm going to ask you to talk a lot with me this morning. There's a few things that we're going to say over and over and over again throughout the message. And I think that it's important because for one, it, it helps me understand that you're listening to me. You're right. So that's easy. That's easy thing for me. But also you've heard me talk before where I truly believe that sometimes when we really want to receive th something, we just need to say it. We need to say it, you know, because we hear it, right? But sometimes we need to say it and let it come out of our mouth and, and come into our ears and get into our spirit. And that's where, where it really takes root. So as a matter of fact, if you look at the life of Christ as we're talking about, you know, relationship and belonging, if there was anyone that could ever stand on his own, if there was anyone that could ever just kind of do his own thing, like a lone oak out and, you know, you look across some of the fields we have out here and you see this big oak tree kind of standing out there. If there's anyone that could do that, it would be Jesus, right? He, 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 was, he was God incarnate, right? So, but he didn't, but he didn't need advice. He never had to ask people around him how to work out a situation like, hey, I've got this family thing going. Can you guys give me some advice? You know, Jesus didn't need that. He didn't, he didn't have to, he didn't have to want, you know, come to you and ask you, hey, I've got this dude that keeps stealing my yogurt at work, and I'm not really sure how to handle the situation. Like, he, didn't, he didn't need that. He, he really could have done this on his own. But instead, instead of doing on his own, he decided to bring other people around him. And instead of a lone tree, he built kind of like this little grove, right? This grove of trees around him, or people in this case. And so even Jesus decided to do life with others. He decided to include, he decided to connect, he decided to do life within context of a relationship. He wasn't that lone oak. So, and, and, and for that, I'm glad, right? For that, I am glad that, uh, that our Lord and Savior decided to do life with other people because I am that other person. Everybody say other people. You guys are on a roll today. All right, so now when I look, when I look at my life and I look at uh, decisions that I've made in the past, and there's actually some decisions that I can look back on and just undoubtedly say that that was a bad decision. You know, there's no question. You could put it in front of a panel of 12 people, and they'd be all like, Brad, that was dumb. You shouldn't have done that. And then, um, anybody ever make a bad decision? I'm not alone. Thank you for that. I was, I was like, I'm up here kind of bearing, being transparent, and um, I needed you guys to see relationship, right? So we're all in this together. So, you know, maybe, maybe you are within arm's reach of your mother, and you say something you shouldn't have said, right? I am a full-grown man, and I still make sure that if I'm going to say something smart that I take a step back. No, I just don't say it right? I learned that lesson. She can cover ground quickly. It's not an arm's reach thing. Um, maybe, maybe second guess that burrito at the gas station. Um, 
there are things that you, that you live and you learn, right? You make the bad decision and then you can move on from it. But, but I, looking back, I also truly believe that there are a few decisions that I got right, you know, at least three of them, at least three in, in all of my years on this planet. I've at least got three decisions right. And, and the first one is when I decided to say yes to Jesus. That was the first and probably the best decision I ever made in my life. And I can even tell you where I was at. It was in a little church on the side of a hill in Decatur, Illinois, just a few miles away from here. I was down in the basement with my Sunday school teacher, flannel graph and all. If you guys don't know what flannel graph is, you didn't grow up in a church. Like they literally took a piece of flannel on what we now would call a whiteboard, and they took other pieces of flannel in shapes of like Bible characters and, and like sheep and, you know, little animals and stuff, and they would, it would stick right? It was like Velcro, but not quite as noisy. Anyway, flannel graph and all. So everything in my life from that point forward was changed. Everything in my life. The second, fast forward 12 to 15 years, um, second best decision in my life. I was on my way home from a mission trip to Niger, Africa, and I found myself down on one knee um, before um, who is now my wife of 17 years. And she, yeah, she's not in here, so I can't embarrass her. She's helping with the kids this morning. But, but um, best decision of my life, right? Best decision of my life. There's a cool story that goes with that. And if you guys get some time, you should ask me about it. But, uh, but number two, best decision of my life said yes to Jesus. And I found somebody to say yes to me, right? Um, <laughs> third is when I decided to be connected and planted, and, and part of the local church. The third best decision I ever made is when I decided that I was going to be committed to God's family within the context of, of what now is this church, right? So when I made that decision to plug in myself into this church, I feel like that was one of the best decisions I've ever made. In fact, you, I just read you my top three lists, so now you know, right? And so in fact, in fact, Number two and number three are tied together because I met my wife in this church. So, you know, maybe there's something to be said. You know, the top three decisions in my life happened in the church, started in the church, and was the church. Right? Do you see a theme there? Is there a theme that you're, are you guys catching on to that? Like, I'll, I'll help you. The, the common theme is church. Right, so in each one of those, I use the word church over and over. I mean, sometimes patterns just don't stick out to people like they do to me. So I wanted to help you. All right, but but so I just so I just celebrated my 17th anniversary with my wife here recently, and I'm very excited about that. It was honestly, I didn't know, I didn't know that my wife was going to be in Kidsmen this morning. It was my full intention to embarrass her this morning. So I hope that she has the TV on in there. That way she can be just as embarrassed, only with less people looking at her. But, but it's, it's when I decided to be in this church. So when I made the decision to plug myself in, this, so this, this is how it happens. And, and what I want to talk about today is, is that the best decisions of my life, the best decisions of my life, again, were saying yes to Jesus, asking Crystal, my wife, to say yes to me and saying yes to the church. And I knew that if I didn't plant myself, I knew that if I didn't commit myself or set myself in the church, that I might not make it. And there are these benefits and blessings and incredible things that happen when you're planted in the church and these opportunities that you choose to plant yourself. All of these things happen. And Pastor walked us through uh, several of those last week. In fact, he talked about how being planted in a church will build your beliefs. He said that it gives you a place to belong. He said that it helps you become all that God wants you to be and it teaches us how to be the church. And, and in, in closing, he talked about how your life will be bigger when you're planted in the church. But what about the meantime? What about the meantime? So we talk about being planted, we talk about growing, we talk about learning and we talk about harvest and we talk about miracles and we talk about getting somewhere and going somewhere. But what happens between when you're planted and when your harvest arrives? What happens in the meantime? So I'll pose this question to you, and we're going to ask this question a few times this morning, but the question is, what do you do when you're not where you used to be, but also not where you're supposed to be? So you know that God has put you someplace. We know that God is helping you. We know that God is growing you, that he's changing something within you, but you also know that you haven't quite made it to where he's calling you to be that you're waiting and you're, you're anticipating for something. So what do you do 
in the meantime. Everybody say meantime. meantime. You feel like you've left your past behind, right? You feel like there's been things that you've been that, that you've been that you've been just totally changed, right? Things that things that you've that you've been things that have been broken off of your life, things that have, that have revolutionized the way that you think and the way that you worship and the way that you, the way that you interact. You've been planted in the church, but you're not to the other side yet. So what I'm gonna do is I wanna pause here. We're gonna read our text this morning. And we're gonna have it on the screen for you, but I really encourage you, if you have your Bible, please get it out and read with me. We're reading out of the ESV, and, um, and we've got a couple of, uh, couple of stories that I wanna read to you out of, out of Mark. And the first is out of Mark chapter four, And I wanted to make sure that we are set. So Mark chapter 4, we're going to read verses 35 through the first verse of uh, chapter 5. And it says this, On that day, when the evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. All right, pause. Everybody say, let us go across to the other side. It's kind of a mouthful, but you guys did great. All right. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling, but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm, and he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is uh, 5, verse 1 says, Then they came to the other side. Everybody pause for a moment. Say, to the other side side. side. of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Or uh, in here, I I have trouble pronouncing this one, so Garrisonis or something, but you guys, uh, pronunciation, not my top skill. But... So let's, let's skip ahead. Let's, if you've got your Bible open, we want to skip just a couple of pages over to chapter 6. I'll give you a moment to flip. If you're on your smartphone, you just got to go to the top and choose chapter and go from 4 to 6. It's really easy. All right, so immediately he made his disciples. We'll start in verse 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him. Hold on a second. Everybody say, to the other side. To the other side. Okay, kind of a theme here again. Okay. So to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully. So he could see the boat. Um, I did a little bit of research and the Sea of Galilee has actually got some kind of cliffs and mountains over on one side. And Jesus was up there praying and they had made so little progress, right, that he could see them. He could see them out there. And for those of you, you know, we're thinking back to that period, you had pretty much two opportunities for propulsion, right? You didn't have, you know, you didn't have a Merc cruiser on the back of that boat. You didn't have a big diesel engine. You had row power or wind power, and they were going against the wind, so that narrowed it down pretty quick. It was row power, right? They were, they were rowing. So this is what, this is what he says. Um, and about, so I need to catch back up. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He's like, hey, guys. They're like, you know, this saying something, if he was able to walk out there faster than how they were rowing. But he, so he, 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 so the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. And now, understand, not like meant to pass by them as in like, see you guys, good luck, you know, we'll catch you on this. He meant like he intentionally walked past them. He's like, I'm, I was walking to them. Walk, he meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and they cried out for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid, you know, um, I feel like that's pretty formal, but, you know, I would have just said, like, hey, guys, you know, it's me. But, and he, so, but then he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And when they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, because just prior to this, they, were, uh, they witnessed the feeding of the 5,000. And so they still didn't even understand that. And now they've got, like, Jesus is walking on the water with them, gets into the boat, calms the sea, calms the wind. And it says, but their hearts were hardened. 
And verse 53 says, when they had crossed over, everybody say crossed over, they came to land at Genesaret and moored to the shore. So what I want to talk to you again about today is we understand that being, there's a lot of value to being planted in the church. We understand that there is a significant change in someone's life when they say yes to Jesus. We understand there are incredible benefits to being planted into a church family. But we also truly believe that God has, has an other side for each of us, that he has called each of us to the other side. He said, hey, come with me, right? Come with me. I want to take you somewhere. And so we go on this journey with Jesus. And so we, what happens between the point that he calls us, or the point that we leave, the point that we're planted, the point that we say yes, what happens between that point and when we get to the other side? And that's what I'm calling the meantime. Everybody say meantime. So God, God has another level. God has a miracle brewing for you. He has a breakthrough. He has a healing. There's another side to what you're currently going through. So I want to pause here. I want to pray quickly because it's really important that, that wherever we're at today, wherever you're at today, it's really important that I want God to open your hearts and I want God to, to open your mind and open your, your eyes to see and hear what he is speaking to you today. So quickly, Lord, I thank you that you are, I thank you that you are speaking us today, speaking to us. I thank you for the Holy Spirit, our helper. I pray that you would reveal to us today something fresh. I pray that you would awaken in us your power. Show us Jesus today. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds, open our spirits to your voice today, and let it be closed to the voice of the enemy. Let it be closed to every distraction, every, every little snare or every little thing that, you've, that the enemy has put out for us to try to keep us from receiving this word today. And we declare it that each person will be able to receive your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And, and hold on. Thank you, Lord, that I have the best wife and the best family in the world. Everybody said amen. amen. All right. So we're all in agreement. Okay. So how many of you, by raise of hands, like the, we're going to do like old school classroom style, right? How many of you, by raise of hands, have ever been on a road trip? A road trip. Like a lot of people, right? A lot of people. So most of, how many of you, okay, let's do this again. How many of you have ever been on a road trip with your family? Also a lot of people. Okay, so you guys are going to relate to this. So, so I love travel. That's one of my favorite things. I love to go new places. I love to try new things. I especially love to try new food. Um, if I, I don't know if Pastor Liz is in here, but several years ago, we were traveling together for a church event uh, with, with some other folks, from, and um, there was about five of us, and we went to a sushi restaurant, and they had on the menu something called omakasa, okay? I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. We already know that's not my strong suit, but... But the guy behind the counter knew what I was talking about. And basically what omakasa means is, hey, you choose. Chef's choice, right? I mean, you're, you're at a sushi restaurant. There's a wild array of stuff that they could give you. And that word literally means in Japanese to entrust. So it's like, all right, I trust. I've never met this person in my life, right? I was in a state that I'd never been to, in a town that I'd never been to, in a restaurant that I'd never been to. And I'm like, hey, bro, omakasa, right? <laughs> Surprise me. I, have, I, I love travel. I love adventure. I love doing new things. It's, it's like one of my favorite things to do. But, and road trips are the best, you know. But there are a few tricks. I'm going to share with you guys today. There are a few tricks that, that you need to learn if you're going to be traveling with family. And it's, it's, it's really short. It's two things. One is that technology is amazing, right? It's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, I am of that age where I have traveled with family pre-technology and post-technology, and I can tell you things got significantly easier post-technology, right? When I, when I have the entire library of Disney movies on Disney Plus on my phone, right, that's way better than, than just like driving by looking at the people in the van like, oh, I wish we had TVs in our car. So <laughs> number two. Number two, first, technology is amazing. You don't have to take notes on this unless this is really helping you and then totally take notes. Leave at night. Leave at night. You're like, I got some people like nodding their heads like, yes, we know, we understand your wisdom, Brad. We understand what you're talking about. If your goal as the driver is to drive uninterrupted 
and you, you know, by either um, pointless questions or um, the world's, the world's most consistent gathering of the, of the world's smallest bladders all in one vehicle <laughs> that are timed independently of each other. So, and miraculously, you go to, and just 10 minutes ago, really? So, if your goal is to drive uninterrupted by all of this, you, what you do, you, you leave while everyone is asleep. And it's even better if you have to wake them up, right? If you have to wake them up to get in the car, then they go to sleep quicker. So, so why would I do this? This is why I do this, to avoid this exact scenario, right? I'm going to walk you through an exact scenario that would happen in my vehicle. And so this is the way it would work. So I'd be, I'd be driving. I should have had a chair. I could show you. Like I'd be I'm driving probably one hand on the steering wheel, probably window down because it's summertime and it's amazing. And I would have, you know, that way you get the sunburn on one arm and not the other. I will have picked out the perfect playlist for driving, um, m- the perfect mix of my favorite music and my favorite podcasts, and they kind of alternate with each other. And just when you're like, oh, I'm kind of d- done listening to somebody talk, then your favorite song comes, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, okay. I've adjusted my seat to the perfect setting. Can I say that, that um, air-conditioned seats are also maybe one of the best inventions ever. But um, I've recently been t- introduced to air-conditioned seats, and they're amazing. So I've got my perfect road, t- road trip snack selection already curated by my wife and I, ready within arm's reach. And I also have my perfect road trip drink, you know, that is also within arm's reach, but not within reach of anyone else in my car, just me. And it is, it is the exact balance between just enough to, quir- to, to quench my thirst and just enough to keep me from being guilty of one of those unintended restroom stops, okay? So all of this is calculated and everything is perfect and the drive is underway and then it happens. Dad. And this is how I would respond. I'd be like, yes, my child, you know, because... And I'd be like, What? I pause my podcast. All right. Can anybody guess what they're going to ask? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I'm like, what do you think? What do you think? Are we there yet? Like, has the car stopped moving? Have I, have I turned off the fasten seatbelt sign for you to now get up and move around the cabin freely? You know, or here's, we have Google maps, right, with voice-guided navigation, and they are so kind to say, you have arrived at your destination. Have you heard that yet? No, no, have you not? You have not heard that. Has the flight attendant come on, which in this case would probably be my wife, and has she come on to the intercom and said, on behalf of dads driving everywhere, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. Um, the weather in Milwaukee is, a, is a, you know, so when the car stops, when I open the door and I pull you out of the car, that's when we're there, right? That's your signal. That's, so, you know, just so you're aware, if any point between now and the point where the car stops, don't be confused if the car just stops, because that could be a stoplight, right? Or it might be traffic. You should also watch for me to unbuckle my seatbelt, leave the vehicle, and then pull you out of the car. That's when we're there. So this seems really simple to me. What do you mean, are we there yet? Of course we're not there yet, and I can, you know, just by watching your guys' reactions, I can even feel like some anxiety from the online audience. They're like, I know, I understand this, okay? I'm guessing that there's a few other people that have, that have experienced this, but the, the truth is that I also was guilty of that, I will admit, as a child. I have asked the are you there yet question. I feel like God is punishing me now with my own children. I don't think God really does that. But, um, but you know, the truth is that when I was in that position, I knew we weren't there yet. When I asked that question, I knew that we weren't there. You know why? You know, I might not know what St. Louis looks like. I might not know what Indianapolis looks like. But I know what Lovington looks like. Um, and I knew we weren't in Lovington, assuming that we're driving home, right? Um, so the point is, this is really what I was telling my dad in that situation. I feel like this is what my kids were telling me. is like, hey, dad, I've done everything I know how to do. Um, now I'm bored. So I'm going to take my boredom and bother you, okay? 
So this is, we're saying that, um, hey, we need to coordinate the time when I'm done doing all the stuff I brought to do and the time that you arrive at the destination. If we could just line those two things up, that way I don't run out of things to do while, while you're driving. Um, you know, I've counted all the cows, assuming that we're driving through Illinois. There's plenty of cows to count. I've counted all the cows. I've counted buggies. I've, I've played I Spy. I've played Slug Bug. I've spotted uh, license plates from at least 35 of the 50 states. I've um, found the whole alphabet on road signs in order, backwards and forwards. Um, um, I've listened to my entire Carmen Addicted to Jesus tape. <laughs> Now, now we know, right? Now we know. 1993 just spoke, and now we know. So don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. So I mean, Dad, I've done it all. I did it. What else do I do? What next? What next? I'm not really saying, are we there yet? I'm saying, do you got something for me to do? So what did you mean? I've run out of stuff to do. Are we there yet? No. Ask me again, and I'll take a two-mile detour, right? So... Have you, but here's the truth. Have you ever asked God that question? Have you ever asked God, are we there yet? Are we there yet, God? Are we there yet? Hey, you told me about this thing. And, you know, hey, you told me about this ministry. Hey, you told me about this miracle. Hey, you told me about this blessing. Hey, you, I'm on this journey with you. I said yes to you. I, I planted myself in the church. But, but when are we going to get there? I've already done all the things I know how to do. I've already, I've, I've already done all of this stuff. You know, hey, I, I've, been, I've been growing, I promise. Like, I went from, I went from reading 3.7 minutes of Bible every day, I'm up to 12.2. I know because I'm very, I'm, I'm very methodical and I input my times in Excel every day and I run statistical algorithms and it's, it's showing a trend upwards, right? I'm, I'm, I've already read through my one-year Bible at least three times. Um, you know, I, I was inviting, uh, last year, um, I was inviting 1.5 people to church every week. Now I'm inviting three people to church every week. I feel like that was a benefit because at 1.5, it was confusing. I didn't know which half I was supposed to invite. Do I do horizontally or vertically? And it's just integers are better. So we go to, I've done everything I know how to do. I've got all my spiritual disciplines where they need to be. Shouldn't I be here by now? Shouldn't I have already arrived at my destination? Here's the question that I want you to consider. I asked this once, I'll ask it again. What do you do when you're not where you used to be, but you're not where you're supposed to be? What do you do in the meantime? Meantime matters. Everybody say meantime matters. Meantime. We don't talk much about the meantime. Because the meantime doesn't make headlines. You don't see the meantime on Sports Center. You don't see the meantime in your Associated Press updates. You don't see the meantime on social media. You don't see, you don't, we, wait for it videos. Does anybody in here actually watch, wait? I'm not waiting for it, right? I'm not waiting for it. You know why? Because I don't care about the meantime. Didn't. I do now. I do now. We are highlight-oriented. Just give me the highlights. You don't get the highlights without the meantime. The meantime has to happen to get to the highlights. For instance, have I ever told you how much I love my family? I love my family. I love my family a lot. But sometimes I just have to tell my kids to stop. Right? They're telling me a story. I ask them, how did your geography test go? And the story starts three days prior with a lost sock. And I'm like, I don't understand. I don't, I don't, I don't need I just want to know how you did on your test. But to her, the meantime matters, right? Because there was apparently, between the lost sock three days ago and the test today, there were a series of events that happened and led up to her score in her mind, right? In my mind is, did you study? Did you take the test? Did you do well? All right, those are the things that matter. But even in Jesus' life, we see, you know, the Bible doesn't even always record the meantime. You know, Jesus from 12 to 30, that was an important time right? It mattered. It mattered a lot. But what do we get in the, we get one verse, one verse in the Bible, Luke 2.52. What is it? You know, one verse for all of that meantime. But what happened in that meantime was significant. And so, you know, Jesus, like he had, I'm sure as most junior high people do, had to discover when it is appropriate to wear deodorant. It's, it's important he also, as you know, had to work retail with his dad. They, were, they sold like woodworking things. And for anybody 
work retail. Like, that is not a light thing. No, you guys are all much wiser. They, they moved on. But what happens in that oftentimes in the church, we talk about what God's brought us out of. We talk about that moment, right, that decision, the yes, but we don't talk about the meantime. We don't talk, we only talk about the highlights. So what do we do in the meantime? When we read these two stories in the Gospel of Mark, we read about the departure and the arrival, the other side, when and then, when they crossed, then they arrived. A lot of people want to know, now just tell me the steps. Give me the seven steps, the seven non-negotiable, indispensable, indisputable steps that I can take to ensure that I get my, my spiritual breakthrough. Like, which book is it? I'll buy the book. Is it a, it, which message do I need to listen to? Is it, a, is it a, a sermon series? I'll buy it. I'll download it. I just want to know what the seven steps are. Somebody please tell me the seven steps. But, we, but before we know it, we turn the meantime into like secret password time. Or we turn, the, we turn the meantime into seven steps to breakthrough time. Um, you know, whoever, whoever knows the secret password makes it to the next level. Whoever, um, whoever has the right seven steps suddenly gets what they want. And if you don't have those steps, you don't get what you want. And so we, we, we take this relationship with our God that becomes more like we're relating to a vending machine. And as long as, you, as long as you input the right thing and as long as you know the right code to type on the keypad, then you're going to get the thing that was promised to you. And I've talked about this before, and it just shouldn't and doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. That's not a relationship. Let me, let, let, let me, let me surprise some of you. You need to understand that what God is most interested in with you is a relationship. That's what he wants. I'm going to help somebody here today. Um, you know, husbands. I don't know. No, I'm not going to say it. All right, I'm going to say it. So, 10 years ago, flowers and candy may have got you a ticket to the secret wonderland, right? <laughs> but now, 10 years later, that same step program, that same secret password might not work. It might not work. You want to know why? Because she is a woman, because she is a person, because she wants relationship with you. That's why it might have worked before, but it might not work this time. I don't get it. I'm typing the same code in. I've typed it. This machine is busted. That's not the way it works. That's not relationship. This whole thing is about relationship, and I, I honor those people that, that, that write books and that preach messages and that do these things that help you because every one of those things has value, right? Every one of those things has something that I can use to improve, to grow, to increase. But the truth is that just because it worked one time doesn't mean it's going to work the next time. The basis of relationship is that there are people involved and people are unpredictable. Oh, sure, you know, yes, yes. Is our God predictable? Absolutely, he is. Genesis to Revelation, but there's a lot of meantime in there. There's a lot of meantime. And he will surprise you. He will, so when we take it all down to seven steps and we're going to get where we need to go, that, that are going to take you where you need to go, where, where do you need God then? If it's only about the steps, if it's only about the secret password, if it's only about did you do these things, did you, did you part your hair on the left instead of the right, or if it's only about that, I'm not saying they aren't important, but if that's all it's about, if that's all you focus on, if that's the only thing you're concerned about, then where does God fit into the picture? There's people here today, there's people online today that are trying to get to the other side, wherever the other side is, and it might be a healing it might be a miracle. It might be a manifestation of a ministry. It might be a blessing on your business. It might be dreams and visions coming to fruition. It might be a family. It might be a spouse. All of these things and, and others. I couldn't ever list them all. But it happens. It happens just like this. You're, you're fishing and the dude 10 feet down from you starts catching fish. And you're like, I'm not catching anything. Man, doing pretty good today, aren't you? Yeah. What you fishing with? 
We want to know what the secret is. Why is it that you're catching fish and I'm not? That's happened to me. And in fact, it's actually really entertaining because I had this lure. It was called a super duper, right? It sounds made up. It sounds 100% made up. And it just so happened that I'm fishing one day and I'm like, oh, you're catching all these fish. I'm like, oh, it's a super duper. It's a super duper lure that I'm fishing with. And it's amazing. Where did you get it? Decatur. They picked up their stuff and they were going to drive to Decatur to try. And I, I mean, I really did. I wasn't lying. I really did buy a lure called Super Duper Indicator. They were going to pack everything up, drive to Decatur just so they could get the same lure that I had, hope that they could get, like, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Somebody makes it to the other side. Somebody gets their healing. Somebody sees their dream come true. Somebody has their breakthrough. Somebody sees a miracle happen in their life. And all of a sudden, we're like, what did you do? What's the secret? And then we tell everybody that if you just do these seven things, if you ju- just do these three things, but you need to understand this is a relationship. God is a person. We have to look to him, not just to concepts, but we have to look to Christ. We have to be in relationship with him. We have to talk to him. He is a person of Jesus. So what do I do in the meantime? We don't talk a lot about that. What is, does the meantime matter? Everybody say, yes, it matters. Do we just hope and wish and pray? that someday the next highlight's going to come along. What do we do? What do you do when you're not where you used to be, but you're not where you're supposed to be? Three years ago, I made this bracelet. Some of you guys might be able to see it on my wrist. And I made it. Um, it's actually just a cool little thing. It's a, just a little washer, and you have a stamp, and you put some words on there to, to be a daily reminder for yourself. And I really felt like God was telling me a lot of what we're talking about today. And when I put on this bracelet, you're welcome to look at it after service, but it just says three words. It just says, value the journey. It says, value the journey. You know, because we've embarked on something and we have a destination in mind, but if all we can focus on is the destination, we're going to lose so much. We're going to lose so much in the meantime. We need to value the journey. See, a lot of people have a misconception. They think that only the spiritually elite make it through the meantime. They think that that. That, that, that there's this level that you have to be at, that there's this, this like breaking point. And if you're, if you're here, then you're going to make it. If you're here, you're going to see your miracle. If you're here, you're going to see this, this amazing thing that happened in your life. If, 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 if you're here, and I'm, I'm never going to make it to the other side, so I'm just never going to be able to pastor that church. Or um, because I'm not at that level, because I'm not the spiritual elite, I'm just never, my, my business is never going to prosper, or I'm never going to see my family, I'm never going to see myself in a healthy relationship, I'm never going to see these things happen. I'm just not spiritual enough. Only the spiritually elite make it to the other side, but look at what we read in Mark 62. The guys in the boat that Jesus handpicked to put on the boat, they cross over the body of water, he takes them on a mission, Right? If you read through the story, they had a mission that was going to happen once they, once they reached the other side. God has a mission for you on the other side. He has a mission for every person in this room, every person watching online. He has a mission for you. That's why you're here. That's why you're in this moment. I don't know if you're in the middle of your journey, the beginning of your journey, or the end of your journey, but you're on your journey, and there's a mission for you on the other side. But look what it said in in Mark 6.52. It said that their hearts were hardened. These guys were hard-hearted on the inside and soft on the outside, like exact opposite of what they should be. Pastor Liz was just telling us a few nights ago about how um, she's learned, hey, you should be a marshmallow on the inside, and you should be hard on the outside. These guys were hard on the inside. They couldn't understand what God was trying to teach them. They were easily offended. And the very next verse says, the very next verse says, then they crossed over to the other side. Now, those two verses don't go together, do they? Which is it? It was that they were so hard-hearted that they couldn't understand what God was teaching them and that they, they, you know, Jesus is standing there saying, you don't have very much faith. You know, I don't know if he said it like that. He was probably much nicer. Jesus, I believe, was very nice. But if I'm in Jesus' sandals, I was going to say shoes, but I changed it to sandals. Did you catch that? Um, If I was in Jesus' sandals, I would have said, why do I have a boat full of of hard-hearted fools? Turn the boat around, go back to shore, and get me some different guys. Like, I saved my receipt. What's the exchange policy on these guys? I'm... 
these guys are clearly not catching on to, you know, they're not picking up what I'm putting down here. So let's, I need some kind-hearted, I need some meek, you know, some soft-hearted people, not these insensitive jerks that are on my boat. You know, they're just jerks. But not Jesus. He takes the hard-hearted all the way across. He took them all the way across. So what now? What is it that they did to make it to the other side? This is what everybody wants to know. You're like, so Brad, you keep talking about that there's no secret password, there's no decoder ring, there's no seven steps. So is that all you're gonna do? You're just gonna leave us with this? I'm like, no, no, I have something. And this is this is what we're gonna close with today. So now what? Now what? What is it that they did? How did they make it to the other side? Listen to me. You know, you know, God is a good God. I know that you know this. God is good all of the time. He wants to do good things. He wants to take bad things. Pastor Liz talked about it not 25 minutes ago. He wants to take bad things and turn them for your good. Right? We know that. God wants to see the desire of your heart fulfilled, which he, he put it there. Why would he put it there if he didn't want to see it fulfilled? And you think, oh, this is never going to happen. He put it there. God is not setting you up for failure. He is setting you up for success. We just have to make it through the meantime. So what do I do? What do I do? How do I access the other side? What is it that they did in the story? I picked out these two stories, right? A couple chapters apart. What is it that they did to access the other side to extend the mission of their Savior? Because there was a mission, right? And they're going to take me to the other side. Something's going to happen. And then, some, and then God has me there for a reason because he wants to work through me. He wants to do things. There were miracles that happened. Literally, he used the people on that boat for miracles when they reached the other side. So what did they do? There's only one thing that I found. One thing. This should be really easy to remember. Everybody say one thing. Like seven things I might struggle with. Like I'd have to get out my notepad or sticky note. I love sticky notes. But one thing it's easy to remember. Do you guys want to know what it is? Yeah. Next week. All right. So <laughs> I'm kidding. They stayed in the boat. It seems, it seems small and insignificant, right? Like, how hard is it just to stay in the boat? Like, okay, you can stay in the boat or you can jump out of the boat. And jumping out of the boat seems dangerous, right? It's storming and there's waves and stuff. And, I mean, the, the, that, the sea is really more of a lake, you know, if you look at it, you know, by modern geographical standards, whatever. But, you know, they could probably swim back. But still, I mean, in the boat seems a lot safer than out of the boat. But the truth is, a lot of people jump out of the boat. A lot of people say, I don't know if I'm ever going to make it to the other side with you guys, so I'm going on my own. It seems so insignificant, but just staying in the boat. Man, it's amazing. The longer you stay around Jesus, the more significant just staying around Jesus becomes. Just stay in the boat. Just to, if you take like one thing, I've said a lot of weird stuff today, a lot of crazy things, but if there is one thing that you're going to take home with you today, if there's one thing you're going to think about, man, that bearded guy up on the stage like a week ago, what was that one thing he said? Stay in the boat. Stay in the boat. I'm going to say it like I'm talking to my children. Okay, repeat it back to me. What did I say? I didn't actually think you guys were going to do that. It was more of like an example of how I interact with my kids, but you guys are awesome right? You guys are awesome. You see, the translation for us today, you want to know how that translates today? Stay in the house. Stay in the church. Stay planted in the church. Stay planted in the kingdom of God. There's, there's going to be temptations. There will be temptations, right? I'm like, I don't, I couldn't even describe to you all the different temptations. I don't know. Maybe it's just that you want to be ministered to by, by uh, Pastor Sheets and Reverend Pillow or something. You know, you just want to stay in bed. I don't know. But first of all, first of all, this is what I want to do. We need to acknowledge that all of us started somewhere, right? It's okay to celebrate where you came from. It's okay to celebrate where you are now. You know, thank God that I'm not where I used to be. Thank God that I've learned a few things over the years. Thank God that, you know, 10 years ago, Brad was very different than today, Brad. I'm not saying I was all bad then. I'm just that much better. I mean, no. <laughs> I'm not the husband I used to be. I'm not the dad I used to be. I'm not 
the leader I used to be. I'm not the person I used to be. Everyone in this room, everyone watching online, you started somewhere. Acknowledge that. Celebrate that. But you still have to make it through the meantime. What do you do in the meantime? Understand that all of your straining, all of your efforts, all of your complaining, all of your whining, none of it. None of it is going to make a difference. It's like my kids sitting in the back seat saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we? This question is not making this process happen any faster, right? This doesn't, this doesn't change like physics. And it doesn't change the spiritual plan that God has for you either. Stay in the boat. When you're, when you're thinking about going off and doing something on your own, stay in the boat. So what do I do? In the meantime, understand that all your straining, all your, all your efforts are not going to get you where God wants to be. You have to rest. You have to trust. You have to have faith. What did Jesus tell him? You have no, what happened to your faith? That God is the captain of your ship. You've got to stay planted. Who is the one who called us? Who is the one who saved us? Who is the one that put the desire and dream in your heart? We've asked this question. It was God. What he started, he will finish. Stay in the boat. Stay in the boat. Don't tell me they weren't tempted to jump ship because Peter did. Peter did. Read the same story in Matthew. Matthew includes a few details that Mark left out. Peter jumped out of the boat. Maybe he felt like he was going to get someplace faster than ever. He's like, I've got the faith. I'm going to take this. But where did Jesus put him? He said, hey, come on. You and me, we're getting back in this boat. And then together, Jesus spoke. He calmed the storm, calmed the sea. And he said, we're making it through. We're, we're, we're doing this together. We're doing this. We're all in the boat. We're doing this together. Galatians 6, 9 so let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we don't give up. When's due season? That's the other side. Don't grow weary in the meantime. We've got to hold fast. We've got to trust God for if, if we don't lose heart. Everybody say, don't lose heart. We will reap in due season, whether this life or the life to come, we're going to reap. Guys, um, stand with me for just a moment this morning. Notice that part, the we shall reap. The we shall reap and say, you shall reap and say, I shall reap. And mine says, we shall reap. We will reap. We will reap. You read through scripture, you notice that we weep together. You weep, I weep. You notice that we also reap together. You reap, I reap. Maybe it was Peter's faith that was needed in that boat. And that's why Jesus put him back in there. See, your miracle inspires my miracle. And we need one another. I'm telling you, in times of storms, in the meantime, in the meantime, we need the house of God. We need it. We stay in the midst of fellow believers who say, I'm not going to let you jump ship. I'm not going to let you jump out. Hey, man, missed you on Sunday. Hey, man, heard you're having a rough week. Want to talk? I could go for women, too. I'm just, you know, personal. We, we, we do this together. Stay in the boat. Stay in the boat. And if it looks like somebody's getting ready to jump out of the boat, say, hey, grab onto them. What do I do when I'm not where I used to be, but I'm not where I'm supposed to be? I'll tell you what you need to do. The one thing, remember we talked about this. We talked about this is a quiz. This, I'm going to tell you right now. You will be graded on this. What do you do when you're not where you used to be, but you're also not where you're supposed to be? Stay in the boat. Stay in the boat. Guys, bow your heads with me. I want to pray. I want to pray for all of those that are watching today, all of those that are here today.
all around the world, and I believe that the love of Jesus is ministering to you in this moment, that he is meeting you right where you are. And I believe that there are people maybe here today that just got back in the boat. There are people here today that have been considering jumping out of the boat. But for each of you, every person, Jesus, right now I thank you for your grace. God, we don't always understand. I don't always understand all of the waves and the wind, and I don't understand why sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. And Lord, we don't understand the storms in this life, but we do know that you're in our boat, and I do know that you will never leave me, that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. And right now, I thank you, my Lord, my Savior, for being in my boat, scratch that. God, I thank you for inviting me into your boat. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now, everyone under the sound of my voice who find themselves in a meantime. Lord, I pray that you'd be close to them in this moment. We thank you that you are a comforter. We thank you that you are a deliverer. You are the one who you, you are our strength. You are the one who takes us through, our, through every storm. I declare over new life today that even though we may be walking through even though, even though we may be walking through a storm, we will not fear evil. That every attack that is formed by the enemy Everything that is created for our destruction will fail because, God, you're taking us to the other side. Thank you, Lord, that in, in this moment, in this moment, that you are healing hearts, that you are healing minds, that you are solidifying people's faith in this moment, that, that as we work together individually and corporately as a community, as a church, we thank you for your grace. We pray that you would continue continue taking us on your journey. Thank you for helping us to value that journey. Wherever you are in this room today, there may be people that say, Brad, I'm not in the meantime. I'm not even in the boat yet. I've been thinking about getting in the boat. Sounds kind of cool. But I'm just not there. And I want to take an opportunity with you right now in this moment, wherever you are, if you're saying, Brad, I want to get in that boat. You know, Jesus, this, this, thing, this thing sounds pretty amazing, and I can tell you it is. He is amazing, changed my life, and he'll change yours. And so I wanna take a moment right now, right now, wherever you are, maybe you're watching online, you just need to, maybe you're listening to this as a podcast, you just need to pull your car over for a second. Maybe you're, maybe, maybe you're in your kitchen, and you just need to set your coffee cup down for a second and focus. Maybe you're in here and you just, need to, you just need to stop thinking about lunch and think about what's happening right now. And, and we, dec- we, d- we want to give you an opportunity to say, yeah, I want to get in that boat. Yeah, I want Jesus in my life. I believe he is my Lord and Savior. So guys, I'd invite you wherever you are today. If that's you and you're watching online, shoot us a message. Let us know. If you're here and you're in person, you're saying, hey, I've never, I've never really jumped in that boat. That sounds like a pretty good, cool boat to be in. It is. It's like the best one. And, um, and you're invited. Open invitation. Plenty of room. Just throw your hand up real quick. We want to pray with you. Thank you. So guys, do this for me. Because we're in the boat together, right? Because we're doing this together. I want you to pray this with me together, and then we're going to turn things over to Pastor. Dear Jesus, thank you for inviting me into your boat. I believe that you are my Savior, that you died on a cross for my sins, that your blood covers my sins. I know that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Thank you for being that Savior. Please come into my life today. 
be the captain of my ship. In Jesus' name.